It is an honor and a pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Gerald DeMello, who is a fixture in the Hawaii <laughs> Island community uh, with an engagement and participation in things like the Portuguese Chamber of Commerce, uh, Homer, uh, Historical Plaques Committee, uh, among a lot of other things. And so today he's titled his presentation, Preserving Hawaii's History, um, talking about Homer Ka'a. And so today, we'd like to introduce Gerald Donald. Well, it's nice to have that kind of introduction. Uh, let me just start by saying good morning and aloha. Uh, and it's really nice to be on campus uh, to see uh, many of you again, but I have a chance to see you very often. We live in the same town, we don't. Um, kind of makes my day <laughs> see you here. But I should know for some of the students, I was here for in administration uh, for like 23 years. Uh, I was faculty at the community college for 10, and I worked in the governor's office for about four, four years. And uh, I enjoyed my experience here of people. Very precious, you know. Uh, and so I was honored when I was asked to come to the talk. I said, gee, how far removed, you know? <laughs> but I'll, I'll do the work. And, uh, you know, um, the kind of thing that I'm going to talk about really requires working and engaging the community. And uh, it, it kind of like ties in with the title of Kuliana um, with regard to the community, because it's our Kuliana. Uh, to kind of like our responsibility to try to nurture the whole coast and the town and give you a sense for a while. Um, but in my work here, um, I had a number of hats. Uh, one of the hats was uh, to engage the community and to engage the village. And uh, I learned some lessons, you know, throughout the years as well, though. But one of the things that I learned uh, a lesson learned that I apply to what we're doing here, historic preservation, uh, that I take away is building relationships and confidences. We build relationships, we build trust, we build confidences, we can do a lot of things. And part of what we're doing here is we have to engage the community to get their confidence to share with us some of the artifacts, some of the endearments, so we place it in a little tiny, tiny, tiny uh, heritage center of the museum. Uh, and our director is a graduate of UHO. Her uh, name is Nicole Garcia. And her assistant is uh, Sandy Kakahashi. And as many of you know, Margaret Shiva, she's, she's a part of it, but she lives in Ottawa. <laughs> so uh, she's right grants for, for the UHO. Um, but you know, preserving voice history in terms of Kota uh, Town is a very, very small, small slice of voice history. And it's just a slice of time. Because if you didn't think about the large picture, we're here with just a slice of time, you know, in terms of human existence, if you will. But we kind of felt that, you know, it was worthy highlighting Kota uh, Town. Uh, because the town is kind of unique in this context, if you take a, a view from 60,000 feet. <laughs> um, it's a contiguous setting, meaning on Main Street, called Mamani Street, it's one mile long, you know, from one end to the other end. And uh, you don't see that in Hawaii today. You used to see those kinds of towns, but no longer. And uh, we felt we're going to document this community history but also people history, that's where the trust comes in. And we wanted to, to document the history because we felt, you know, with the closure of sugar companies, which was 20 years ago, it was kind of like a little downturn and it was kind of demoralizing. So we wanted to uplift that town. So the contributions of the families, the people, the workers, it's not a history of kings and queens, but it's, it's a history of shopkeepers, workers, yeah, everyday people. Uh, not a history of the chairman of Hawaii Island or the governor, 
for the president is everyday history. We call it nearby history. And um, we felt that by tying to the families, we kind of enrich the community we have. And people come back and say, gee, you know, we talk about different things, about how good they feel about having the grandfather's picture there for the story. Um, and finally, um, enriching the community, but it also helps what we call software. And that is, um, it helps the small mom and pops. It helps the, the small businesses because the history component brings people in, and I'll give you a sense for that. Um, and of course, it becomes an economic stimulus because people come in to see the town. And uh, so the efforts to help cultivate our town, um, to have it be a stop in town rather than bypass town. How many of you have been up to Waimea lately? Anybody, Anybody stop in Honka? Hey, all right. It's <laughs> up to old. Okay. Um, okay, so we want to do what we're doing yeah. to have it be stop in town. Yeah. Um, to help the mom and pops, to help the businesses, to help nurture the history. So people coming in, they feel good about telling their stories. We have docents who talk about their grandfather went here, this and that. So it's kind of a cool kind of thing. Yeah? Now, how do we do this? Um, we, we kind of said what we want to do. We begin preserving. Now, Raka is roughly about 39 miles from here. It's about 14 miles from Miami. And at the time that Puraka'a was the second largest town on this island, there was no Kamala. You had Pahol. You didn't have Kiao, you had Bola. <laughs> um, but you didn't have towns. But you could drive up the Hamakuo coast, starting in Pataiko, Pitikeo, Munamu, Makalao, and you could still see some vestiges of little village communities. Each one of them, all the way up to Puraka'a, was the largest. We have a post office and a movie theater <laughs> and the different camps. And uh, you get a, a sense for that, but there was a richness there. Now, all this gone for the most part. One more, I guess people are trying to do stuff. So we have said there, uh, gee, maybe uh, we have a story to tell. Uh, maybe we can help with this. So we put in highway signage. Let me see if I can get some of this going here. So, welcome to a town, that's up, and we put the signage in, we got brown signs, because we can relate, if visitors come from out of state, a brown sign that's used nationally. So basically, we've got five of these um, on one of the whole highway. From Hilo into Honaka'a, we've got signage coming in from Waimea, if you go to visit Waipio, Valley, you come back in, you've got signage. So it's, it's kind of interesting, but the sense of, I'll show you one point. The idea that I talked about, building relationships. No build relationships, it's going to never be done. Because the loops you got to jump through to get signage, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Just a simple signage. And so having had experience putting up the University of Kauai signage, <laughs> I learned how to do it. <laughs> so we got that one. Um, and of course, you know, the epicenter of sugar uh, on the island was Kauai Town. And so when you go to Kauai Town, there's about six murals like this that tell the story of the town. Um, be it the uh, old Hawaiian village, Paniola Town, Sugar Town, as such. And Sugar Close is roughly around 1994. This is the last harvest. It was a big parade, big celebration. Uh, and then following that, close ups, a lot of empty spaces. And so we went, whoa, uh, we've got to try and so what I gave you is kind of a cut and paste. Okay, I got 15 minutes. <laughs> but it's a picture of my wife and I. We are like the fourth generation benefactors of a forever building in my car. And I had no idea 
it must what happened to me. <laughs> and I know I would continue working here. <laughs> but but uh, you know, based on that, you know, we felt that you know, the architecture the integrity you know, of the town, you don't see anywhere else. Yeah. You don't see the long Hawaii Han but it's kind of split right here and there. Um, and so we felt that our so called revitalization, if you will, was linked to our historical past. So a signage coming in, the brochure each of you have, you know, relates to the walking tour. You can get self guided walking tour. Um, we're trying to drum up someone's interest to have a small business to actually do a walking tour. I mean, later. But, you know, um, we, we, we look at the identity of the town, and if it's just one building, forget it. Yeah. Um, so the Kuliana responsibility is to work with everyone, build that relationship. Because when you have 38 buildings together, which is in town, then you got something. Because then you have you know, a sense that historical significance, kind of a specialness. And you know, for the town itself, civic pride and livability, because people live in that town. <laughs> Upstairs. Um, so, um, and we felt that oftentimes, the small sliver of history, you know, the plantation history, the history of the town, oftentimes is overlooked. So we felt, hmm, you know, and that's what I do. So, uh, try to bring this thing. And so, when you walk to the town and you use that brochure, and you mention it in the first two sentences, you kind of a step backward into the 19th and 20th century. And most of the buildings you know, are built in 1900. There's a couple, 1898, um, and up to about 1927. There's 38 structures, 32 comply. We didn't want to do it historic district because we didn't want the county to zone it. Because if they did, none of the merchants would come in. We go to see them, again, building relationships, building trust. We go to the store. There's a couple of stores there, fourth generation, the hardware store. 100 years. We go there and we talk to them. They go, hey, Joe, you know what you guys do? You know my grandfather told my father. Who me? Yeah. Don't get involved with government. <laughs> Don't get involved with regulation. Because the plantation always tried to shut us down. They want people to go to the plantation store. So we're going to maintain our independence. So this seems to me like something that we work on today. No problem. No problem. Stay where you are. Watch us. If we are successful, we don't know what we are, we're just starting with two or three. Um, then, then, you can say to yourself, or join me, or you can say, hey, you know what? We're going to be part of status quo. So we did that. Third year, I'm going to this is pretty neat, all the plaques. How are we going to get more? <laughs> and I should note that Dr. Wu out here, he helped us in a lot of different ways out in uh, town. Uh, and uh, Dr. Rich is not here. I'm sure our historian here, Communicates with a lot of those people, Shed, our directors, and students. <laughs> so we're all in it together. But I think that's a good statement. Trust, confidence, um, and we're all in it together. That's not the message we try to get. Now, um, so we worked on, on the clothes. On. That's an actual picture now of a clothes. On sale. What's interesting is when that's a theater, 1931, it's on the registry. I think you can, can't see the plaque. Oh, the plaque's on the side. But this building, 1927, you notice the steps. One, two, three, four, five. The bank people told us that if you look at the steps that they put up the bank, this was the second largest town. This had great promise because the sugar industry uh, was something that was really flourishing. And if you go to downtown Hill, with the Pacific Museum, Tsunami Museum, and you go to the front part, there are steps. When you had steps going up to the bank, it symbolically represented the idea that it was promised to the town. So, I promise that day. So, we thought that was pretty neat. And of course, the theater still does movies. 
1931. So we miss a film here in town. Call them up. You can drive out there. Have a good lunch. Tough story. Um, that's the university employee is probably like um, with Stephanie Kim. And that's a plaque that we put up. Um, it's the kind of plaques that you're gonna you're gonna see uh, on maybe 20 of the 38 buildings. We're still working on it. When you do the walking tour, it tells you that the brochure tells you the history of the town. So uh, and we also we also also have there's a peace parade that we try to you know nurture as well. The Western Week uh, plantation years, which is coming up in October. Uh, we tried it for the first time. Um, and this is kind of interesting. During World War II, when a couple of little bombs, you know, Bucker Ranch didn't want any, any drinking. They didn't want any of the guys to come up early in the morning. They wanted to go to work, 6 o'clock. The little bombs, you know, there was, there was hardly anything there. And so the people from Camp Terrell, there were like 20,000 Marines up there. And they took on and on the top because you had many bars, many theaters, some gambling, and da 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, when you get done drinking, you know, there's pictures of you know, the bar here, and Marines lined up here, lined up here. First time, all the way, step back, next point, and all the way through this. this. But when they get done, they would always go to Cafe Paradise and they would eat a meal on the side in. But they couldn't remember when they went to the back of the base. So they would tell the folks there, after you guys get done, having your beer, having your drinks, before you come home, go to a corner restaurant and get long soup, which is side in. <laughs> so from that period of time to now, uh, we have a signage. Uh, and you know the, the sad part of it is, uh, Camp Tara, a lot of these Marines that shipped out were the ones that went to uh, Guadalajara and Guadalcanal were major, major battles. So, for a number of them, this is the last stop. Mm -hmm. that. So, we honor that, and people come in and say, hey, you know, my grandfather was at Camp Tara. You guys got any kind of info? So, we share, and then the herd is set with the whole. So, and of course the murals. Okay, so these are the murals um, that you see around town. Uh, who come to Katsuboto. Uh, here's Katsuboto. This is the memorial. Um, again, the library is here. If you looked up from the library out the window, you would see where, unfortunately, it was very, very sad, very unjust where, you know, they hung him, that's what they did. Because he was considered to be like a first big organizer. Mm -hmm. And when people came in from Japan, not knowing the contract, he would know English, so he would kind of go through it with them. And you know, he got to be someone that wasn't very, very promising and very happy to the community. But, see if I can find that there. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, so it's it's a painful history, but then again, as a historian, I can tell you, you need to have you know, the big picture on both sides. Painful and very challenging because you know that's a sense of when you find social justice when you go and look at what happened to the people on the end, you need to walk away. So um, it was an uncomfortable time and difficult to remember, um, but then again. Well, the fact that Betsy was talking, did some research on it, she's got a book on it. Um, in 1973, way, way back, very young, almost young, he's been long here, <laughs> I was faculty, and Dr. Triyama was from Kumaka. And he was faculty in the day, and he had talked to him about Kasuboto way back then. He was a one class school graduate, and he didn't know anything about it. And, and later on, when we did this, yeah, he came, you know, in addition to he uh, was the academy principal. He was also um, in my He was also principal there. And he became a, a Buddhist priest. 
So he came to bless. So he leaned over to me and says, Hey, do you know about this long time ago? <laughs> and uh, so that was kind of nice. You know, so we did that out. And so that part of history is this whole thing. Talk about it. Anybody have a sense for who worked this out? This one, this side of it. Uh, just call out someone. Not here, but talk to you. Take a guess. Who came, who came to do sugar? Oh, Japanese. Japanese? No. Originates? <laughs> no. Filipino? Filipino? No. Chinese? <laughs> Portuguese, no. Okinawan. Okinawan, no. Chinese. Puerto Rican, no. Chinese. Then there it is. I took out the title here. But, you ready for this one? Ukrainians. Oh. Oh. Ukrainians came to Hawaii Island. I said, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm and if you go up to, um, they were here, primarily in the Mountain View area. And I, I, went, I went to school with uh, at UI, with the Moroccans. And we all called them Russian, it was a nickname. But really, they were Ukrainians. And I don't know if they knew that either. <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, they were the descendants of. Yeah. And so when you drive up, um, I guess, uh, I don't pronounce it very well. But, uh, it's like, is that cool? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so when, when you drive up toward Mountain View, you know, on the other side, you see there's a couple of names that we always know the Russian and put it in the And here's a book. Ukrainian. Okay. 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 <laughs> I never knew that they were Ukrainian. I always thought they were Russian. <laughs> so, really, so, you know, part of our, why we do what we do, I want to cut a small slice of history to preserve it. Is because we need to preserve history, our history becomes invisible. Invisible at the fact that they were <laughs> So, uh, and, you know, when we go to a first account, um, it comes alive with the history. And when you visit the town, uh, go to the, here's a club that probably what the father owns. And this is where the history center is located. And again, without building relationships, you couldn't have this center because you have to pay rent. So you want to have a balance. You want to have a community spirit. You want to have an uplift. Uh, so it was like that way. So that's kind of, hey, how are you? <laughs> and it's a little, there's a plaque on, on uh, Yolanda's dad, yeah, of the, because her father was kind of like a lot of You know, in addition to leaving school at 17, going to the, the army, coming back, learning technical skills. Working for a foundation and college building. He developed, you know, the Pernaka ditch, the Pohala ditch. From there, he got water because the, the area does not have water. He figured out how to best do this. Yeah. And so back then, um, Arabia had just become a state. Her dad was asked to go to Egypt to help work, work as a team with a lot of people on the Asman Mountain. And then there was a battle. After six months, he came back. But in addition to, you know, being 17, her dad, four brown stars, you know, the military, and, uh, you know, a lot of recognition. Uh, I know you didn't kind of do that. <laughs> so we did a, we did a black on her family. We wanted to have families from the community recognize her dad came to the top of this. But again, relationships are important. You know, for any kind of historic preservation, any kind of work, any kind of history, you gotta talk to people and to access their photos, to access their stories, their their stories, 
you got to have the trust, which is something that other Ed Luigi would have to do. Which is, you know, kind of funny, but you work with 51 people. <laughs> okay, so that's it.